There's a call to re-evaluate the required minimum pay for ag labor and the adverse effect wage rate rule. Michigan's current minimum wage is around the $10 mark for workers who don't get tips, but the minimum wage that farmers can pay their H-2A workers, $17.34. The executive director of the Michigan Asparagus Association, Jamie Clover Adams, says the true cost is even more than that. Now, I talked with her recently on this issue. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Let's get into this week's Agnet Weekly. Great. I wanted to talk to you about the adverse effect wage rate rule and its effect that it does have on growers. Now, this has been around for many, many years, but to start off, could you help explain to our listeners who maybe are not in agriculture, help explain to them so they can understand what this rule is? Yes, so the adverse effect wage rate um, has been around since the mid-1980s, and it's basically the government-established wage that you have to pay workers that come in from outside the company or outside the country, excuse me. Um, The H-2A program, as we fondly call it, is how you bring legal migrant workers into the United States to help harvest your crops. So when you have H-2A workers, and I've I've, uh, just been reading over what some of the current rates are in each of the states, Michigan's wage rate is among the highest. I saw that California is the highest, but Michigan was pretty much high up there. So with having these rules that the federal government puts into effect on what workers pay, and we're not talking about a small amount. I think it was uh, $17 and something like 34 cents for Michigan. What kind of an effect does this have on agricultural businesses? Well, that seventeen thirty-four per hour, the other thing that um, the chart won't tell you is that growers pay housing and transportation costs as well. So the all-in rate is about $27 an hour here in Michigan, and that rate has increased about 45% over the past seven years. Uh, the effect on growers is uh, significant. So in hand-harvested crops like asparagus, Labor accounts for about 50% of our aggregate expenses. And our growers are using H-2A because they don't have any other choice. Uh, The domestic worker pool has dried up, so there aren't any domestic workers like there used to be, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, So they moved to the H-2A program. The impact that it has is that as growers' costs increase, They do what they can to find efficiencies to uh, reduce their costs, but overcoming that wage rate is near impossible. And when you look at asparagus, for example, in the grocery store, over the last five years, the cost of a pound of asparagus at grocery was about 260 to 280. So it hasn't really moved a lot. And listeners will know everybody's costs have gone up. And so that just means that everyone's increased costs are pushing down onto growers. Uh, We have seen declining grower returns for each of the last seven years, except for 2020 uh, during COVID when imports couldn't get into the country. And so the pricing was up a little bit. Yeah, and it's like in any business when your costs continue to go up and up and your income is not going up comparatively, that can lead to businesses going out of business. And the same is is true for farms. Yep, that is true. And it's not just asparagus. Uh, You see it in a lot of other fruits and vegetables. You know, you look at broccoli and bell peppers and squash and blueberries. We have a lot of blueberries here in Michigan. Those growers are experiencing the same things that asparagus growers are. And what happens is farmers will make other choices um, for their commodity mix. It's a little harder When you look at asparagus, which is a perennial crop, it's a 15-year planting. You've got a $5,000 per acre investment in it when you put it in, so you don't just rip it out uh, willy-nilly. The same with blueberry bushes, but you, you do have to look at it and make choices for what you're going to do on that land. And I think that's our big concern is that we are seeing growers Um, take out asparagus plantings, uh, change their mix on other kinds of vegetables. Many of my growers grow a lot of other types of vegetables. They're moving to those that don't take as much hand harvesting. 
And what does that do for food safety and food security here in our country? USDA tells us that 50% of fresh fruits and 38% of fresh vegetables are imported. And that is not people eating more bananas and mangoes. That is, that is more imports coming in during our season that are holding down returns for growers. And, you know, are we going to, as a country, decide that we're just going to rely on other people to supply the most nutritious things we need in our diets? And that's, that is the road we're heading down if we don't do something about this AWAR rate rate. It is significantly higher. I pulled some data from Mexico, and I'm being generous that they pay 25 to 30% of what we pay in wages. That, that's pretty hard to compete with. And, and how do we ensure that we have those nutritious fruits and vegetables for American consumers in the future if something should happen, like we saw in COVID, with disruptions in supply chains. Playing devil's advocate here, you know, for years it's been a matter of um, people who maybe are not involved in the industry or uh, certainly not farmers, you know, they'll say, well, farmers just don't want to pay wages or they're taking advantage of their workers or not using legal workers and they just don't want to have to pay for it. What's the response to that? Well, I, I think our guys, you know, the the workers we get, uh, our farmers get, are they work hard, <laughs> and they earn every nickel that they make. But the purpose of this wage is to pay this wage so you're not having an adverse effect on domestic workers. I can't speak to any other parts of the country, but I can tell you here in Michigan, there aren't any other domestic workers. There are not domestic people, people, Michiganders, who are knocking down farmers' doors to work in the asparagus fields or to harvest zucchini or squash or broccoli. And so who are we having an adverse effect on? I would also say that they make this wage, they don't pay for, they don't pay taxes, they don't pay housing, they don't pay utilities, they don't pay for health care. If you take all of that and factor it out, a U.S. worker would have to make about $30 an hour to be as well off as an H-2A worker is at this wage. So my personal story, my daughter, who has a college education, who's in her fourth year of employment, makes about the same after she pays for her housing, her taxes, her utilities, her health care as one of our H-2A workers does. I can guarantee you that her company, when they have increasing costs, they can raise the price of their product. Now they can't go you know, way out there and, and raise it a lot, but they can raise it. Growers cannot do that. And the way that the H-2A wage rate is established uh, defies economics, um, is not a sound way to do it but the government refuses to change the way that they do it. And so here we are. Yeah. And another, you know, another comment that I've heard, certainly not from, from our farmer listeners, but again, is comparing it to minimum wage. Oh, you know, it's just above minimum wage. Well, we're talking about $17.34 per hour in Michigan. Do you happen to know what the Michigan minimum wage is? It's about, um, I want to say now it's about $12 an hour, yeah. roughly, um, in there. And again, I would say that, you know, it's seventeen thirty four, but it really is about $27 an hour. Right. Because farmers are paying, they're not paying for their housing, they're not paying for their transportation. Um, and if you work at, you know, the local McDonald's here, um, you're making more than $12 an hour, but you're paying for your own housing. Um, but yeah. I, I, we would be happy to pay the Michigan minimum wage. And, you know, and that's the other thing is uh, they the way that they establish the AWAR with these different regions and different rates, um, it allows, if, if we went to our minimum wage here in Michigan or a little above, you know, say it's the minimum wage plus a little bit, um, those workers have choices of which farms they want to go to. So, if they would, if they want to make more, they can go work on a farm in California where they're paying more. 
that that's their choice. That's there's competition in there, you know. So we would have to be careful where we set that rate here in Michigan, and that our growers would be providing the wages um, that would lure workers to Michigan uh, when they're out being recruited in Mexico and beyond. And you pointed out um, already, uh, but going over this again, this. Uh, again, it's called the Ad- Adverse Effect Wage Rate Rule, and it was created or it was put into effect back in the 80s, and it was kind of created over something that was uh, started back in, I think, the 60s, and then mm-hmm. modified, changed the name, but pretty much the same thing, so back in the 60s. But the purpose of this was to not hurt, not have a negative effect on U.S. workers in agriculture. And as you pointed out, there just are not U.S. citizens who are out working in the fields very much um, anymore. So do you feel like this is still relevant at all? Or should it be, let me ask you a little bit more specifically, should this be changed or should you, or should this be um, just done away with? Well, (laughs) we'd like to see it done away with and allow for you know, some other formula that takes into consideration a state's minimum wage or a state prevailing wage. But even more basically, if if that wasn't doable, um, they really need to look at how they set this rate. This rate is set by the National Labor um, Survey that's done by USDA NAS. It was never intended to be a price discovery mechanism. And what we've seen happen is that as the United States has had to use more and more H-2A workers with this higher wage, they're included in that survey. So you have this ever-increasing number because you have more and more workers that are part of the workforce and that are a part of that um, survey that sets those rates. So that's number one. Number two, the rule itself I guess the economics of it worked back in the 80s. You know, they assume that you can have ever-increasing wages and eventually you'll get to an equilibrium wage where U.S. workers will come and work. When you have imports where they're paying 25% of what you pay in labor, that just doesn't work. Again, it might have worked in the 80s when we didn't have a lot of imports, but they really need to relook at their model. There are more sophisticated models out there. There's data out there. The DOL has their own data that shows that the number of domestic workers has declined. So we have this old way of setting the rate, and then we have this flawed survey and, and again, to defend USDA, that's not what they set the survey up to begin with. It's just how the Department of Labor has chosen to use it. That includes the wages of H-2A. And you, you just see this. It, it just does not make any policy sense that you would not use modern economic or economic analysis and the data that you have to set these rates. But my growers would like to see them done away with and will pay the state minimum wage or more. You know, just looking at this from an agricultural news point of view, I don't hear a lot of, of talk about this. And I, I'm wondering, do you feel like uh, Congress understands this issue? Are they paying attention to it? I know that we're in a farm bill year, not only farm bill year, but now we're in September. So things are, you know, farm bill obviously high priority. They're talking about a lot of other issues. But do you think that Congress is aware of this? I think so. And I think if you have a congressional member that represents an ag area, they understand what's going on. But there are a lot of issues that swirl around this with immigration and undocumented workers and dreamers and a bunch of other ones that I probably don't know anything about. But there is all this and that's the way legislation is made. You never, my, that's what my growers say. They'll say, why can't we just put a cap on this? Or why can't we just, you know, have some certainty? And that, that just doesn't happen because the other side, as you, you brought out some of the issues, they'll want something too. And so we get into this spiral of where nothing can get done. But the unfortunate thing is the status quo is going to continue to drive production of fruits and vegetables offshore. Doing nothing will ensure that our fruits and vegetables come from other countries 
um, and not from the United States. And, you know, my growers are going to start growing other vegetables or they may start growing corn or soybeans or wheat um, where there's government support, there's government subsidized crop insurance, and there are export markets. You know, those were all the questions that I had for you, but I wonder, is there anything else that you would like for our listeners to know? Um, I, I just think that, you know, where listeners, if you're, well, I guess if you're a farm listener too, but, you know, look at where your fruits and vegetables come from. And during the U.S. season, you know, purchase U.S. grown product. That's tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Um, that's where we can really make a difference here in the, in the medium term is just, you know, supporting our local growers and buying their products. Thank you once again to the director of the Michigan Asparagus Association, Jamie Clover Adams. That's this week's AgNet Weekly. I am Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for tuning in.